Hey guys, uh, my name is Kapono Siadi. I'm executive director of What School Could Be. Good to see you all here today. Uh, I'm joined by Ronnie Moore, my co-host today. Ronnie, welcome. It's your first co-host with me. You're uh, you gotta unmute yourself. There, <laughs> we, yeah, <laughs> Not always always off gets well. me. I, I think I was going to tattoo on my forehead. I think you're muted, but um, not you, just in general with our Zoom world that we live in today. Um, Ronnie, I, I wanted to let people know how excited I just told you a couple minutes earlier, how excited I am that you're co-hosting because you are uh, part of what school could be family or what school could be former fellow. Um, you were with us all last year formally, but you're also just finished your master's program at High Tech High Graduate School of Education. Um, and so you're kind of the bridge to our conversation today. Um, and on that, I wanted to just give you the opportunity to introduce uh, our two guests that I am super excited about today. Well, thank you so much. I am so excited to be here and I'm really excited um, to be on this episode. Um, just um, introducing Mari Jones and Dr. Michelle Pledger. Um, let's start with Mari. Um, Mari is the director of deeper of the Deeper Learning Hub, which is a, a national practitioner hub whose mission is to spread deeper learning practices and ensure that more students across the country are achieving deeper learning outcomes. Um, she's an improvement facilitator for uh, the Center for Research on Equity and Innovation, um, and she supports K-12 teachers across the 16 high-tech high uh, schools in literacy and social emotional learning um, through continuous improvement. And now she supports the CARE Network, um, which is an initiative that seeks to support San Diego County schools in systematic caring uh, to keep their eighth grade students on track to graduate high school and career ready. Um, and so Mari's always felt that education is a form of activism, and she's very passionate about promoting social change and equity by empowering youth. Thank you so much for being here, Mari. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited for this conversation. Yes, thank you. Um, and so I'm going to introduce Dr. Michelle Sadrina Pledger, who was one of my professors, one of my favorites at, um, at High Tech High. Um, she's the Director of Liberation for the, at the Center for Equity, sorry, let me get this right, at the Center for Research on Equity and Innovation. So super long title. <laughs> this is a center that brings together practitioners and researchers and youth to address complex problems of practicing K-12 education. Um, she also co-directed the Share Your Learning campaign, um, which spread student-centered practices um, to 5 million students. Um, she's committed to disrupting inequity in education and cultivating a community of practitioners who honor the lived experiences of all their students and educators. Um, she is also, as I think we're going to talk about, the author of Liberate pocket Size Paradigms for Liberatory Learning, um, and that this is a must read for any educator who aspires to design educational experiences that are responsive, um, culturally responsive. And um, so, yeah, thank you so much for being here, Dr. Pledger. Thank you so much for having me, for having us. You know, Mari and I are huge supporters of the What School Could Be Network, and y'all have been supporters of us throughout all of our deeper learning conferences and our deeper learning globals. And Mari and I have just had a great time contributing to the various playlists that you have on the innovation playlist. So we're excited to have this great conversation with all the beautiful humans out there listening and watching. We got so much to talk about and definitely uh, we need to make sure we save time to talk about the caring and connected uh, community playlist uh, in this, just because um, that has been the playlist that I think has gotten the most attention recently because of the same reason we're having this conversation, because I think the, not I think, the world is in a little pain right now and educators are quite confused. Educators and being in pain and confused certainly impacts kids. Um, and it kind of goes to the thesis of why we felt, uh, I felt that this conversation was essential to have this year now uh what school could be you know our, our launch theme uh in the fall is caring and connected communities i'd encourage anybody uh watching and listening to jump on the community and check out the resources of which you know mari and michelle were huge contributors to uh, so many of those resources on those playlists um i would i'll start off with a statement and then i'll i'll ask a question so the reason we wanted to have this conversation is my firm belief that the deeper learning initiative is an equity initiative. And when it's not an equity initiative, uh, something is awry with the deeper learning work we're doing. 
um, that in my humble opinion, those things aren't separate. It's, I, I love weaving metaphors, but for me, it's not even uh, an equity woven into deeper learning. For me, it's more like chemistry. Like it is the fact that these things, many things are interacting, equity being one of the things that makes it deeper learning. So uh, kind of predicating the conversation right now and thinking about a start of a school year, um, the, the pain, the confusion, but also the hope and the, uh, the actions that we can all take and we are taking to make this you know, a super, superlative year as we go forward. So towards that um, end, tell us a little bit about your journey. How, how do we get to, uh, to Mari and Michelle you know, being at the forefront of equity and deeper learning? Yes, I'll start at the beginning. I was born, no, I was born in San Diego, <laughs> California. I grew up in the Inland Empire, which is like Rialto, San Bernardino area of California. And I experienced a lot of internalized impression in schools, but I did succeed and achieve. I love school. I love learning. So I achieved a lot, but it was at the sacrifice and expense of my own like cultural identity and loving who I am and where I come from. And my love for education continued, like went to undergrad at UC Irvine, master's at UCSD, doctor at UCSD and Cal State University, San Marcos. And, and when I became an educator, I was just so excited to lean into this world of young people, help them develop their unlimited potential. And after 15 years of being a K-12 educator, 12 of which were at the High Tech High organization, Mari and I both moved at the same time in 2017 to co-direct the Deeper Learning Hub and co-direct the Sherry Learning Campaign. And then ultimately I became the Director of Liberation. So all of those experiences led me to the space where I am now and I work on several different project teams, but I get to guide the internal capacity building around our DEI and liberation efforts. And of course, because Mari and I work so closely with Deeper Learning, that is infused in everything that we do, which we'll say probably a little bit more about later, but I'll let Mari talk about her journey here. Sure. I was thinking about this, like um, when we facilitate, oftentimes we do like a one minute autobiography. So that's that's the structure that I'm using for this as well. Um, so I was born in the Philippines, moved to California when I was nine, uh, went to UC San Diego for college and grad school. Um, I spent the first seven years of teaching um, at a traditional district school here in San Diego, kind of in the south of downtown, uh, focusing mostly on emerging bilingual learners. Um, I spent the second seven years at a social emotional project based charter school called High Tech Elementary Explorer. And what I saw in terms of the discrepancy between those two experiences for young people made me feel this sense of, it can't just be for the kids who are lucky enough to go to a school like this. We have to do more to shift the entire system of education. And so that's what brought me back to grad school, got a second master's in um, educational leadership at High Tech High GSE. Um, and then when I graduated from that, we got funded by Hewlett to start the Deeper Learning Hub, which was meant to I was like, what am I going to do after grad school? And it was like, oh, would you like to do large scale change in education to spread deeper learning? I was like, yes, yes, I would. So that's when I got into that role, which I continue to do. Um, went around the country with Michelle in the Share Your Learning Showcase or campaign and um, reached 5 million students publicly sharing their learning with an audience beyond the classroom. And now here we are today. That's amazing. Well, um, you know, we've had uh, uh, several times to overlap, work together, support each other's work. I mentioned the Caring and Connected Community and then uh, your all's kind invitation to have us be a part of uh, Deeper Learning 22 and 23. 22 and 23, is that what we did? Yeah. Um, and uh, that was just really neat to work alongside you guys. Hey, Ronnie, um, before I throw it to you for a question for Michelle and Mari, um, I, you know, I gave my, uh, my metaphor. I think that the work between deeper learning and equity is more like chemistry than it is weaving, although I like the weaving metaphor. What's your thoughts on that, Ronnie? You've, you've been through the master's program at High Tech High. You've been working with us, and you came to this work with a depth of expertise already. Um, what are you thinking, Ronnie? In terms of like what equity is in education right now, in deeper uh, learning, in, in a deeper learning push and in this kind of uh, transformative education model that we're all working in here, whether it's, you know, through 
high tech, high uh, deeper learning or what school could be organizations. Uh, how do you see those fitting together? Yeah, I think that um, there, there are a couple metaphors that I that I go back to in my mind. But um, I think what this calls up for me is like what at our basic level, what are our even overs for for um, the students that we we work with? Uh -huh. um, and so I tend to to um, think about if every student were my student, if I were their mm. parent, what would I want for them? And usually that is a way that um, that helps me think about about equity. What what do I want for my students? What I what do I want them to have? What do I know about them? What um, what would I want other people to know about them too? And how would I want them to to interact with my students based on that? It really helps me to kind of humanize every, students, um, humanize everyone when I'm when I'm thinking about the decisions that I'm making for them. So. It reminds me what uh, Susanna Johnson, our coach, uh, uh, says when she does trainings that uh, education is uh, the, the profession of human development. Mm -hmm. So um, I would like to ask um, both of you, uh, just building on your expertise and experiences, how would you define deeper learning for equity in education? So for me, deeper learning for equity means that students, especially those who have been historically underserved by our educational system, experience school in a way that's authentic, that's meaningful, oh, excuse me, that was loud, authentic, meaningful, and that helps to develop the skills and dispositions that they need to reach their fullest potential. So it's making sure that school matters to young people and that the experience they have there is um, what they need for them to reach what they can be. Yeah, I'm building on that. I mean, we think about this a lot, but for me personally, deep learning for equity in education is really about facilitating learning experiences that give young people a deeper understanding of themselves, deeper understanding of others and the world around them. But it also creates opportunities for them to develop their full academic and social potential right through liberatory practices. And we're really about trying to disrupt those predictable patterns of success and failure. And so that's this is why we do it. That's kind of how we, that's why this we deal. <laughs> this is how we deal for equity. <laughs> yeah. So I heard you mention liberatory practices. For those of us who are uh, uninitiated, could you tell us more about what you mean there? Yes. Um, so when I think of like innovative or emerging practices in education that we're seeing um, in, in our spaces and, and journeys around the world, First comes to mind some of the teams that I work with, um, the Center for Love and Justice. So they really focus on liberatory project-based learning. And if you're like, what makes it liberatory? Like what makes it different from traditional historical project-based learning? But they're really intentional about integrating identity, belonging, place, dialogue, democratization, and liberation into all of their projects. So for me, that's like one exciting practice that's happening. I love what the D School is doing around the intersections of futures work and equity and how what that means and how that might help resolve certain equity issues, but also it could exacerbate some. And I love that thinking. Um, there's a lot of movements around authentic learning movements. We were, Mari and I were just speaking at a conference this past summer called Partnerships for Authentic Learning and Leadership, where all of these educators are trying to do things differently in their classroom that really speak to young people. And everybody knows culturally responsive sustaining pedagogy is my jam. So I'm all about that. Um, so those are just a few that I'm into. I'm excited to hear what, what Mari's response is to this question. Yeah, so when I think about promising practices that are leading to more equitable educational experiences for young people with a frame of deeper learning, I'm thinking of advisory and the structures that are designed to connect to the humans in the classroom. Um, the idea of teachers really getting to know their students as humans and as learners so that we can tap into those funds of knowledge and the interests of students and the natural curiosity of those learners as we design experiences for them, um, which by the way, um, Innovation Playlist does have some stuff around advisory for those of you looking. Um, Inquiry-based approaches that ask kind of open-ended questions that engage students in active learning to figure out those answers for themselves. Obviously, project-based learning we talked about already. Um, internship programs that allow students to get into the real world and start to like 
experience the real world and connect the learning they're doing in school with that. Um, and then this idea of just like reflecting all the time in school. Student metacognition is super powerful. And that is something that any educator can do in any context. Hey, Michelle, earlier you had said something and uh, I, I, I was gonna about to write it down and I didn't get the whole phrase that you said and I wanted to push into it a little bit. You said disrupting predictable patterns of something. Success and failure. Disrupting predictable patterns. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I find that to be a really important uh, idea uh, that I've been thinking a lot about. Sure. I mean, when we're looking across any sort of feedback or surveys, whether it's looking at grades or, or test scores or what have you, right? We're, we see those, many of us in education, I hope people in the, in the chat room can hear me. We see those, those patterns where you see when it's, when it's disaggregated by race, right? We see different levels <clears throat> of achievement. So when we talk about doing work that disrupt those predictable patterns, it's work that when you go back to looking at, and one, we're not big about on standardized tests, as you know, but let's say that that's what you're using. When you go back and look at those things, you shouldn't see those predictable patterns. If we're serving all young people, we shouldn't see those predictable patterns. It's not the students that have a problem. It's the system that has a problem. And so the more we can do to create conditions and, and liberate systems in a way to really honor and serve young people, then we wouldn't see those predictable patterns of success and failure. Is that clear? Is that no, it's super clear. And I, I love that idea of, you know, looking at data and then re-looking at data to see what patterns you might predict and how our actions can disrupt those patterns from happening. I think that's a, 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 a powerful way for us to think about it. Um, I want to just welcome people who are in, here watching live um, and in the chat. We have a pretty robust chat going. Um, please feel free to, you know, drop in comments, ask your questions. Uh, and I actually want to ask the next question that we had on, on our minds, um, but then maybe if you don't mind, add uh, a filter from the question in the chat, uh, and you can take it wherever you guys want. But um, you know, the question that was on my mind was what were some of the innovative or emerging practices in education uh, that you see um, that you believe hold great promise for uh, the deeper learning and equity uh, work that we're doing? Um, if I were to add a, a, a focus to that, um, Jennifer Klein, a uh, friend of what school could be, um, in the chat had asked, uh, would love to hear how uh, Michelle and Mari think we should support leaders and teachers who are trying to do the equity work through deeper learning uh, when local or national politics or culture push back. So I might amend the original question or add to it by saying, you know, what are you seeing? What are those innovative emerging practices that are helping us do deeper learning and equity work? And... Um, are you seeing ways that that's harder, easier? Uh, how do we navigate that in the political scene that we find ourselves in today? Sure. Well, because I answered some of that first one, I talked about the, the D School, Center for Love and Justice, Authentic Learning Movements. I'm going to dive into Jennifer's uh, question. It's a juicy question. And Capona, you and I have actually talked about this before um, because educators are, are really in a difficult situation. I've been working a lot with educators in Ohio and in Florida, and those are states that clearly have legislation that is making it very challenging for teachers to do what they know works with young people. Um, and so there are a couple of things I think about. One, it has to do with semantics. So for example, there was a teacher who was doing a project and it was called a social justice project. And she got a lot of pushback um, from parents and caregivers who just immediately go to, you know, you're, you're brainwashing my child. The next year she did the same project, but she called it a change makers project and didn't receive that pushback. So some of it is just in word, like we know what words are going to trigger certain people. And I think it might've been Tim Knowles from Carney Foundation. I might be misquoting, but he said something like, um, change the word, but don't change the work, which I think is really important for all of us to think about. If we know those words that are gonna, uh, just change the word, but keep the work the same. So that's one thing. So that's the, the semantics, but then there's the substance of, of what we're doing. And to me, that, hap that has to do with knowing specifically and clearly what those laws are when you look, and there's a great organization that maybe we can send out to folks later, but it's like, know your rights. And it has 
all of the laws in each state, the new legislation written out. And if you know it well enough, you know how to do things to get around it. Like, for example, I think in one of the I feel like I don't want to give these secrets away in case those people are infiltrating this conversation. But anyway, if you like look at one of the Florida laws, it says something like you can't actually I won't talk to me offline and I'll share something with you. But the point is, if you know those laws well enough, you can navigate them and still do the work that we know is important for young people to do, especially as it relates to deeper learning for equity. Mari? Oh, I I mean, some, I don't have that much to add other than it makes me think about the phrase that we often use, which is cultivating creative noncompliance. Which cultivating is what we do. Cultivating creative noncompliance. Yes. Tell me more about that. What does that look like, Mari? Basically, we know what's good for young people. And if we center these young people in the things that we're doing, we can call it whatever we want in a way that's going to help us continue to do that work and know that what we're doing is actually what's good for young people. So, Thank Cultivating you so creative noncompliance. I'm writing that down right now. That's awesome. Yeah. So I just, um, Capono asked a similar question earlier, but I'm really curious. I once read a book that compared a kindergartner's first day of school to a senior their first year of school. And the point of the comparison was just thinking about mental pictures we have of students' uh, enthusiasm and the loss of enthusiasm over time. And I remember thinking um, or asking, or the author asking how much of this has to do with just natural growth and development and the loss of novelty uh, just over time and how much of it has to do with just how we approach school, how boring it can be at times or how kind of creativity crushing, soul crushing it can be in certain spaces. Um, and then it was an incredible time because a few weeks later, um, I had the privilege of attending a workshop um, with Dr. Asif Wilson. He was talking about how he had the privilege to, um, in his home city of Chicago, visit a lot of schools where students were, um, uh, affluent schools where students were being taught to um, use their creativity to answer big you know, questions and solve big problems. And he compared that to some of the schools in the city where students were taught to sit, comply, write what the teacher wrote and regurgitate it later. And so as I think about equity, these are the, the major paradigm shifting uh, thoughts that come to my mind after experiencing these and so many other um, things that I've read and experienced, I now have a view of what equity could look like in my space. And I'm just wondering, like, what are those moments, those crystallizing moments that you have that have gotten you to where you are in terms of um, what your non-negotiables are for equity in the spaces where you serve? Awesome. Um, that's a great question. And I think for me, the biggest paradigm shift as an educator was this shift in focus from creating compliance and a focus on how do I get students to comply to developing student capacity and agency. Um, that was a significant shift that happened because when I started teaching um, in that traditional district, I used a lot of extrinsic motivators, right? Tr table points, names on the board, detention. I caught you being good, gold star. And the thought behind that was like, if I just told students whether their behavior was good or bad, it would help them make better decisions. And that system of rewards and punishments actually made it so that students learned to show when they were doing the right thing and hide when they weren't. It didn't actually influence their behavior in other ways. And so what that meant was as a teacher, I was like having to go police less supervised areas of the playground during recess, feeling like I had to be super vigilant and suspicious of student behavior. And that really wasn't a good feeling for me. And what happened was, I can tell you this moment exactly, when I started working at this the other school, um, Explorer, I was on recess duty and I watched recess run itself, which many educators can tell you does not happen on a regular basis. And students were literally, they knew how to engage in the activities. If they had conflicts, they would problem solve with each other. And then if they needed support, they would come get an adult to help them with this problem solving. But like this idea of like students could actually have the autonomy and agency to run their own free play was like super profound for me. And what I 
how that transferred into my classroom is I took away all extrinsic motivators and I started using language that really helps students understand the impact of their actions. So the focus was about like, well, how is what you did impacting yourself or other people in our community? And when I did that, the shift in students to becoming much more independent learners and much more interdependent learners was like super powerful. And that turns out a lot of deeper learning comes from teacher beliefs. And so if I had to name one of those over, or what do you, what do you call them, even, even overs? Yeah, it would be over. this idea that like the communication of our unwavering faith in students is like everything. So that's probably what I would say. Oh, I love, love, love it. So Mari is my sister from another mister, my bestie in a Tessie because she does have a nice Tessa. Um, so I'm going to build on that, that believe comment. I think the important, or I know one of the important paradigm shifts for me happened when I made this connection between the intersectionality of my background beliefs bias and how that was showing up in my teaching behavior because we're especially at high tech high we were we were designing our own curriculum you get to design your own projects and so once i started to see like okay my and and steve shapiro who's actually here in the audience he has a, a great podcast called experience matters we talked about this on his episode but i realized that my race showed up a lot in my curriculum i was very is very race forward, right? Because that was something that was really important to me. And I love talking about it, designing, having students experience and make meaning of that. But LGBTQ plus was not really at the forefront in my curriculum. And it had a lot to do with sort of my background experiences, beliefs that came out of that, biases that came out of that. And it shows up in our teaching behavior. So this belief that we could be these objective teachers, it's just like not true, right? Like we are subjective beings. And that subjectivity like impacts what we do in our classroom and how we do in our classroom. And so that was a game changer for me. And my even overs became honoring young people's humanity, their whole humanity, not just like the student part, but their whole humanity, doing my best to cultivate curiosity. Like, what do you want to learn? What do you want to do? What do you want to explore? And really like unleashing that unlimited potential, because the ideas that they come up with are always way better than what I would come up with on my own. So like co-designing exhibition or co-designing projects and then really jumpstarting their joy. Like life, and this isn't just for young people. I mean, Mari and I teach adult learners now and I try to do all these things in adult learning as well. Like make sure that there's like joy and love and hope. And I know some of our grad students are in the audience right now. And so I, I saw Michelle is in here and, and um, Karen Elaine. And so thank you all for being here. But this is something we can do for everyone, for young people and the adults, right? I don't even know if I answered your question, but I answered a question. So <laughs> there you go. No, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. It's great. So let, let me just push into the, the question a little bit more, maybe the answer a little bit more, not even the question, but the answer a little bit more. I would love just to linger uh, on this idea of student agency, student voice, uh, what, you know, Jennifer Klein and I've written about uh, protagonism, students as a main actor of their education. You know, Mario, you, you'd, you'd given uh, a couple examples uh, with the playground. You guys have both produced examples with us. Uh, okay, I'm a teacher. What does that look like concretely in my classroom? Like, what are those strategies that amplify student voices within schools, that amplify student agency, that create protagonism? Uh, you know, I go back tomorrow, metaphorically tomorrow, next week, next month. Uh, and what am I doing in my class? Yeah. Oh, there's so many good things you can do in your class. Um, well, let's start with like, if we accept the premise that equity in education means that young people get what they need to be academically and socially successful, then we need to hear that from them. Right. So one of the first things we can do, and I know many of us already know this and hopefully do this, is listen to the young people that we are working with, right? Um, we can work with them to co-create these equitable learning environments, right? That's really important. I remember um, our colleagues, uh, Dr. Stacy Callier, she shared with me that empathy is the first step toward equity, right? We have to understand what someone has been through, what they're going through, if we're going to be able to be responsive to them. So 
empathy interviews are one of my favorite ways to get at that. That's like one-on-one -on -one interviews where you're getting to know a student. Research indicates that students who believe they have a voice in school are seven times more likely to be academically motivated than those who don't. So like if you're a person who like you need to know that research said it, yeah, research said it. So anyway, back to this. So empathy interviews is one way. Another way is through if some people feel like, oh, I can't do empathy interviews with so many students. I used to do this thing called lunchtime love where I would have like four students. We'd have lunch together and I'm getting and it's also safer for them. They're, they feel like they're there with their friends and we're having conversations. I'm getting to know them. I love Dr. Christopher Emden's student ciphers. And one of the a lot of the teachers we work with in Hawaii actually use student ciphers as a way to get ongoing student feedback, right? They're meeting with the teacher regularly to get feedback on what's happening. Those ciphers rotate so that every student gets an opportunity to be a part of the cipher. And um, that's a beautiful way to do it. And they're seeing a lot of uh, change in, in their classrooms. And then also the PERT survey, which Mari knows even way more about than I do, but we have our educators do that PERT survey and it's not just about doing it, but then sharing that feedback back with the young people. Like we do like a four, two Q four celebrations two growth areas and some questions sharing all the data back with students and then co-designing what to do next. Right. But in all of these things, whether it's an empathy interview, a student cipher, a survey, like it's our response that matters. Like we can't just ask for them to share their voice and be like, well, they shared it box checks, right. We're moving on, but it's about us being responsive to that. I think that's like the, a very easy lift or easeful lift for, for people to do, for educators to do. We just did a couple workshop series and uh, used empathy interviews in the workshop series to, to as a way to understand the content of transformative education, the landscape model of learning, deeper learning. Um, and it was just really neat. We did short ones. I think <clears throat> we did like a, a, a four minute back and forth structure. So it was like the whole thing was 10 minutes with, with two people. And it was, I was, I wasn't blown away because I've seen it done before. I was so heartened by what was, what bloomed from a 10 minute investment. It was just really neat. That's awesome. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the, um, the PERT survey that Michelle kind of mentioned because a student perception survey like that. So I'm part of the care network, like uh, Ronnie mentioned. It's an eighth grade on track network that's run by High Tech High Graduate School of Education. And four times a year, all the teachers in the network give all their students this student perception survey um, that's based on the PERT survey. It basically asks students to kind of use a Likert scale to share how much they agree with statements that correlate with six learning conditions that matter for student success. So those conditions are like sense of belonging, affirming identity, teacher caring, meaningful work, feedback for growth, student voice. And the students respond with, oh yes, I feel like I have a lot of that in the classroom or I get to experience this a lot in the classroom. So they share their own experiences. And the really great thing about it is that PERTS examined how three of those, teacher caring, meaningful work and feedback for growth, correlated with the chances of earning a B or better in math. And there are some direct correlations with students were two times more likely to earn a B or better in math when they rated learning conditions more positively than most negatively. And also those learning conditions mattered across demographics. So like in some cases, learning conditions have been found to be especially important for students who have been less well served, students who were initially performing less well or they're members of marginalized groups. So as that network, we disaggregate that data and we look specifically at our black, Latinx, indigenous, and low socioeconomic status students. And we take a look at how are they um, rating their experiences and how is that comparing with the whole group? Is there a difference? Um, and not only do teachers use that feedback to think about their practice. And then like Michelle said, they share the data back with students. And when they share it back, they say like, here's what you all said. And then let's generate some ideas for how we can create more positive learning conditions. So for example, if the sense of belonging was low, how can we make each other feel like we can belong? And the students take part in that. And then there's a sense of like, my voice matters. My teacher's really listening to what, how I'm experiencing this. Um, so that's really, really powerful. But I think there's like the other piece of student voice coming from just thinking about how classrooms are structured from like sage on the stage, guide on the side. Y'all have heard that terminology. 
the idea of whoever's doing the talking is doing the thinking. So how do we find more ways to support students in being the ones who are doing the talking in our classrooms? So we use a lot of protocols and talking structures that help support this in our GSE classrooms, but also in our K-12 classrooms. And while students are talking, I put on my researcher hat as a teacher and I observe students, I listen in on those conversations and that data that I'm getting in real time helps me plan my next steps to make sure that I'm giving students what they need next. Um, so those are some structures that I think really help amplify student voice. And thank you so much for sharing those. Um, something that I've been become more interested in over time is, is thinking about um, those moves that we make as we're all trying to um, make our spaces more equitable, where students feel more of a sense of belonging. Um, where have you seen uh, practices that, that look like equity or they sound like equity on the surface, but they might be like wallpapering over the cracks? Like what looks like equity but should actually be rethought as a practice. Oh, we 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 have experienced so much of that. Um, let's okay. <laughs> like, where to begin? So first, I'm gonna start with buildings, right? So sometimes I'll walk in schools and they have all these posters with platitudes that project this image of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then when you start talking to teachers. You start doing some classroom observations and 100 percent when you start talking to students like that is not their lived reality. Right. What's on those posters is not what they're experiencing. And I I'd venture to say probably the disaggregated data is also like not what they're experiencing. Um, so one of my favorite expressions for one of my least favorite phenomenons that I witness is like your music doesn't match your lyrics. And that happens in so many of the places, you know, the spaces that I get to work in. And so that's really frustrating. Um, another one is around like box checkers, right? When sites have like one PD a year, and it's usually just a PD about bias, just that just to let you know you have it, but not to let you know like what to do with it. And they'll just check it off as like we did our DEI for the year, right? I had a teacher who came to me and said, you know, we ran into each other somewhere randomly. And she was like, you were the keynote speaker at... Um, our opening for the year. And it was so amazing. We, we were all excited. And we thought we were really going to like lean into like DEI work and doing all this culturally responsive work with our students. And that was it. That was, we never did anything else the rest of the year. And she was so frustrated. And she said, um, you know, that keeps happening. They'll have this thing at the beginning of the year to say like, hey, we did this, but then there's no follow through, right? There's no really accountability for the work, right? And it's like, we always say, just because you taught something doesn't mean students learned it, right? So just because you had an equity PD doesn't now mean that like your whole staff and faculty is now magically equitable. Like we know that liberation work is lifetime work. Uh, I'll just say a couple of works. I know, <laughs> I know that Mari has some of her own. Um, I don't like when places have just one team or one person that's in charge of equity because everybody else feels like they just abdicate and like, that's not my responsibility. Talk to the equity person. Um, and then they they don't they're not a part of the work uh, when people think that representation is enough. That's that's a frustrating thing when people confuse inclusion with integration or fitting in with belonging. And Jamila Dugan actually has an amazing article called Equity Traps and Tropes, where she just lays out all these different ways that people try to like do equity. Um, and I bet you if you if you take a look at that article, you'll be able to spot exactly where your organization is. But the good news is, like, once you notice something and you name a thing, then you can do something about that thing. So um, I'll stop there. Mari, <laughs> what do you got? Um, some of the things where I see something that looks like equity, but sh is not actually maybe. Um, I think you might have mentioned this is like when people are talking about equity, but they're not actually looking at disaggregated data. So they say a bunch of stuff about equity and how they need to be more equitable, but then they don't look at their data to see where are the disparities and what is actually happening for their young people. Um, I think another big one is like when people want to kind of create this like change in practice immediately. And so they do the PD about the change in practice, but they don't address the mindsets. And the mindsets are super important. Uh, that leads to some other places where I see some of this work happening where they're trying to make changes to practice, but then the language they're using to talk about students, communities, and families is super deficit, right? 
and they're saying, oh, but that part we can't do because the parents don't care because the students, blah, blah, blah. And then you're creating these kinds of ways to have the educators be off the hook because it's not our fault, it's theirs. Um, and then one of the things that is like a thing that I think about often, people call these things equity sticks, you know, when you have all the students' names in a, on a stick and you pick them. Um, and oftentimes that gets used as a cold call gotcha moment, which actually raises the level of like, stress for young people to be able to find a quick right answer. Um, it's actually very inequitable to use those. <laughs> but if you use it in a, you can use them powerfully if you give students enough think time and you actually have everybody think. And then you can say, I'm going to call in a few people. Is everybody ready? So then it's not a gotcha moment. But there's some places like that that I think it shows up a lot. I, I'm glad you brought it up, Mari, because I think there's so many of those tools and and, and that that were uh, you know potentially at one point one point either you know originally well designed that have kind of devolved into a lowest common denominator use or maybe weren't particularly thought out well, but other people have thought them out well and how to use them. Um, I've seen some really neat uh, implementations of those popsicle sticks, equity sticks, or whatever. Um, mixed with, you know, just simple like Kagan strategies where we're going to do a, a, a think and then a pair share. Uh, and now we're going to pick them up because I know everybody's thought, I know everybody's discussed. And now that's going to be how we share out to the class uh, rather than, like you said, a gotcha moment. Um, but it's so interesting to think about all these, you know, practices that we we have and where we we try so, I, I don't know, I try so hard and in the day sometimes don't get to think about the, impact of some of those small steps that I'm doing. So, okay. So I have a, I'm going there some, somewhere with there because I kind of want to connect that idea of the big work and the small work. So I've worked with schools um, that have been trying to do the work, but don't have the, the cover or direction of the big work. They don't have uh, an equity statement, not that that's always necessary, but that's also really nice to have that kind of big cover, right? The board says, or, or uh, the school commits to, um, and then I worked with schools that have that, but then, like you said, you walk into the halls and that's up on the wall, but then there's not the small steps. So maybe if I continue to push into the small steps and uh, tee up a little thing, one of my favorite small steps that is connected to really big thinking is a really cool book that I've read called Liberate, Pocket Size Paradigms for Liberatory Learning. Um, I like it because it's super, I mean, it's really grounded in in important big ideas, but it's also practical and happens to be written by somebody in the call. Um, you, can either one of you talk to, or both of you talk to uh, Michelle, your book a little bit, because I do think it, it does that job of bridging those worlds of the big and the small, the necessary and the daily, the, the, I, that wasn't necessary, but you know what I'm talking about. Thank you. I'll, let, I'll actually let Mari start. I'm just curious what she might say about it. <laughs> Well, what I love about this book, uh, in addition to me loving the author of the book, um, <laughs> is that you can start at any place in this book, right? So if there are things that, um, some of the things require a lot more self-work, right? And some of the things you can do pretty easily, right? Like changing the way your classroom is set up is something that is, you know, pretty, you can get it started tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Um, and some other things, the thing is, the book is here for you, wherever you are in your journey. And that's what I love about it is you can pick it up, you can find something you want to shift, and it gives you really practical ways to do that and why you would want to do that. Um, so that's what Capona was talking about, it gives you the why. So you've got this big picture, but you also can go, oh, this is how I do it. And it's very practical in that way. And you know, I love me some practical things. <laughs> she does. Thank you, Mari. That. Uh, thank you. I appreciate hearing that. I'm, I'm legit blushing over here. And I, and I will say I had someone actually yesterday text me a photo of her copy of Liberate because she's she's had her copy for a couple years and she keeps going back to it. All of the pages are ripped out. They've fallen out because that first uh, iteration, we had a student print shop create them, which was beautiful. Um, but she's used it so much and gone back to it so much. And this is a veteran teacher, y'all, who's already doing phenomenal work. You can check her out on the innovation playlist. Her name's Candice out in Sevilla. And um, she just sent me a photo like it's it's falling apart. So I'm going to, of course, send her another copy because 
because um, I know that she uses it, but it basically breaks down like how to liberate your consciousness, your classroom structure, your curriculum, your communication, your cognitive capacity development and your conduct constructs. And it just gives educators the simple what, why and how, and then also a plethora of resources to just continue, as Mari mentioned, more of their, their self-work. I always say it takes a little over an hour to read, but a lifetime to implement. So um, thank you for, for bringing it up. And we, we do have a workshop um, related to it this Saturday. If y'all haven't signed up, we would love to have you. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much for the information. I'm sure we can hopefully get more information on where, why, or not why, where, when, how <laughs> to, to, um, to attend the workshop. Um, I'm wondering, in, in your class, uh, Dr. Pledger, what I noticed was you were constantly pulling out like thought leaders that honestly I had never heard of before your class, but I'm so glad that I know them now. Um, I'm just wondering uh, if you could pull out some of those thought leaders for, for the rest of us to, um, to go back to. Um, and I'm wondering if you can recommend any specific resources, books, thought leaders to follow. Um, specifically those who um, have most impacted your practice, obviously. Definitely. I mean, for me, and I think for, for many educators, like the most important thought leaders that we want to listen to and be responsive to are our young people, right? They're, they're in the work. They can tell us firsthand about the inequity they may or may not be experiencing, right? So I see them as thought leaders. I think our families are thought leaders, like if, if we're willing to invite them into the space. But to go to the specifics, I mean, you already know my lane, my jam is culturally responsive, sustaining pedagogy. So for the goats for me in that arena and in the arena of abolition are Dr. Gloria Ladson-Billing, Dr. Geneva Gay, Dr. Lisa Delpit, Dr. Bettina Love, Dr. Chris Emden, uh, Zaretta, Zaretta Hammond, of course, culturally responsive teaching in the brain and for social emotional learning, Dina Simmons. When it comes to self-work, courageous conversations about race, culturally proficient leadership, is everyone really equal? Anything by Elena Aguilar, um, my white auntie, Brene Brown, like those are people that I go to in terms of my own self-work. When it comes to like being a, a female leader of color um, and just a, a black female in general living in this world, uh, particularly this country, uh, Eloquent Rage by Brittany Cooper. And then for brown girls with tender hearts and sharp edges, like those are, I mean, I could go on. I have a whole like, recommended books, resources list, um, happy to share with folks. And I just keep adding to it. Um, I would say right now though, Dr. Goldie Muhammad is just who I am just I, loving, 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 and have been loving since Cultivating Genius. But many of you know her new book, Unearthing Joy came out. And I love that it comes with a playlist for you to listen to, like as you move through the book. So there's just so many people that I respect and admire. And if I didn't say you or your book, I apologize. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Mari, do you have any to add to that list? I mean, that's a pretty extensive list. Um, <laughs> I feel like there's a couple of things that I would add in terms of when I'm talking about the kind of language that we use to empower students to feel a sense of agency and replace our extrinsic motivators with the kind of language that actually requires it requires to build that in students. I would use my favorite teaching book was The Power of Our Words by Paula Denton. Um, what I love about it is it has these appendices that say like, you're thinking this, say this. And like, it's so useful because I would literally use it and read it every summer before teaching again, like just to like as a refresher. And it was super useful for that um, in terms of like everything we say and don't say to students really does make an impact on them. So like how we communicate is significant, I would say. Um, and the other resource would be probably Unbox, our journal for adult learning mm -hmm. at High Tech High. Hey, Ronnie, you just came out of a, a master's program. You're kind of collecting degrees. If you guys don't know Ronnie as an educator, you should, because she's an amazing educator collecting uh, multiple degrees across different disciplines, uh, a fantastic thinker as well. Uh, I think it's worthwhile asking you, Ronnie. Ronnie, what are you, what are you reading now? What have you read? What would you ask people to to, to think about right now? Well, um, the, and you didn't ask me to say this, but I am going to say the landscape model of learning. Um, still reading that, and I think, uh, and I'll, it's a book by Dr. Capono Ciati and somebody who's also here, uh, Jennifer Klein. Um, there are so many 
impactful lessons that I got from that book. Um, one of them being just the idea of, of thinking about learning as a horizon. Like there is no end point. And so I think we all kind of know that, but just um, behaving that way in schools, just ensuring that you're, you're continuing to talk about learning as a continuum. Um, I think uh, besides that, I, um, one of the most impactful books that I've read, just thinking about equity in schooling, I was talking about today with a colleague, um, Hip Hop Genius. And I think we've, we've had um, Sam Seidel on. There was like a uh, anniversary of this book, but one of the most impactful um, um, thoughts that comes to mind from that book is just that, you know, there are all these, um, there are all these talented musicians that went to this high school in the Bronx and they, the school never talked about their talent, never invested in them. And then it named all of these talented people that went to the same school. And so when I think about equity, um, I come back to those examples of like, you know, how we can really pull out the genius in, in all of our students. So haven't as I have been in grad school, yes, I've been reading more articles, but in terms of books, those are the two uh, that come to mind right now. Awesome. Well, I've been rereading some of uh, Dr. Christopher Emden's uh, books, his uh, first couple that he wrote uh, recently, and that's been really fun. Uh, if you guys haven't checked out his books, definitely do. Um, I, we, we have a little bit of time left. And if you don't mind, I want to go back to a question that was way back in the in the chat there about um, how, the question is, how do you see the community being engaged in deeper learning and liberation with K-12 educators? I don't know if I'm interpreting the question correctly, but I, you know, part of what school could be, the work we do is in mobilizing communities. And the reason that's the first playlist that we propose is because so much of this work is, well, all of the work is more powerful. All of the work sticks better. All of the work transforms uh, more profoundly when that work is, is done in the context of community and with community. And that can be so hard and it can be so powerful and it can be so sticky and it can be uh, really difficult. And you know, having been a classroom teacher for as long as I have been and a school administrator as long as I have been, I, I I has always aspired to that, and that was always difficult. Um, there were always peak moments of amazingness of this year, that PTA, PTSO, whatever it was, was just so helpful, and other years where it was the opposite. How are you guys think about that? How the community is engaged with deeper learning and liberation and educators? Are there good models of this, more, more challenging models of this? Are there specific steps that you would recommend? How are you guys thinking through this? Michelle, do you want to start or should I? Um, one thing that it makes me think about was the whole premise of the Share Your Learning campaign was around engaging community in the work that students were doing in schools, right? Mm -hmm. So this idea that we want students to be able to talk about what they're doing and how they're learning, but not just with a teacher, we want them to talk to the public and the community. And so when we bring in the community to see what students are capable of, so let's take an exhibition of learning as an example, then you can witness for folks who were not sure about this whole deeper learning thing, you actually can watch them shift their thinking because they're seeing what students are actually capable of. And they're able to like be there when students are talking about what they've done, what they've learned, their whole process. And it, build a lot of community buy-in for what we're doing in our school. So I would recommend those as a good starting place, like bring your work to the public and talk about it um, because that's, and have the students talk about it, not just you, um, is, is probably one of the most powerful ways that you can engage community in deeper learning and in deeper learning for equity. Yeah, I mean, I obviously 100% agree with everything Mari said around exhibitions has been like one of the best ways to get the community involved. And project-based, problem-based, place-based, whatever kind of based learning you want to do, the more you can involve community partnerships as well. There, there are so many people who are hungry to work with young people. If you tell them about the work you're doing, they'll want to get involved to either give students feedback or be experts, uh, expert critique givers, or attend like a presentation of learning panel or things like that. Recently, and I, I'm bringing up Hawaii because I just got back. So a lot of those memories are fresh in my mind, but we were working with Hawaii Tech Academy. And even in the PD that we had the first day, there were 
school leaders, teachers, students, community partners, all in the same space, doing and experiencing a project slice together, and then thinking about how to translate that into the school setting, right? I mean, we have all these opportunities to integrate whoever we want into our design, but it does mean something about like seeding some power and like sharing power and, and understanding the concept of not power over, but power with, like we can do so much more when we're working collectively. Um, there was another last year, I had the opportunity to work with Aisha Bain and we were at a, a community in Florida in, in Delray Beach, Florida. And at that space, there were teachers, leaders, community members, people part of the collective and students. The youngest person there was 11, the oldest person there was 94. And we were doing all of this work around future visioning, like learning from our past, honoring our present, and then visioning for the future with all of these people, you know, thinking seven generations ahead, all that type of work. It can happen. And it's not, right. it's not that challenging to do. Um, we just need to be willing and, and create the conditions for it to happen. I don't know, did we answer that question? Oh my gosh, yeah, that was amazing. Mari, you were gonna add something? Can I add one more thing? Yeah, please. It makes me think about the role, the very important role that school and system leaders have in creating the conditions for communities to get together like that. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, the more that we can be working with school and system leaders to think about how you can lead for deeper learning, how can, you can design for deeper learning, how you can create an adult learning culture within your school that exemplifies deeper learning. You can't expect adults to create deeper learning for young people if they don't experience it themselves. So like that's really significant too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It is the top of the hour. And before we say goodbye, uh, and thank our amazing guests, and I thank my amazing co-host. Uh, a couple uh, updates and uh, announcements we'd like to make. So I'll share with you a few things happening in the What School Could Be community. Uh, I think we got a couple graphics for that coming up. Um, we have a few events. Uh, next, the big step, Deeper Learning for Equity Liberate with uh, Dr. Michelle Pledger, uh, September 23rd and 30th, 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. Uh, I really want you guys to uh, consider checking this out. It is a natural follow-up from this conversation. That's how we designed these things. Big think and big step. Uh, please, please, please check that out. It's up on our site live now. Uh, we have a couple other things coming up, including the next big think, which is right around the corner. Uh, it is Real World Learning with Elliot Washer, a good friend of what school could be uh, and uh, part of Big Picture Learning. That's going to be October 3rd, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Please do join us for that. Um, please do consider joining the What School Could Be community at community.whatschoolcouldbe.org or just go to whatschoolcouldbe.org. Uh, if you haven't joined yet, click on join in um, and uh, join in on the conversation there. I think it's a, a wonderful place for us to stay connected. Appreciate it. Um, so uh, what I want to do next is, first of all, thank my amazing co-host, uh, Ronnie Moore. Ronnie, it's been really nice having you co-host this with me. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I'm looking forward to many more of these with you. Uh, and uh, last but certainly not least, in fact, most importantly, I want to thank uh, Dr. Michelle Pledger and Mari Jones. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's a privilege. Uh, and it is always really fun to talk with you guys. Please check out their work. Check out the work they've contributed to what school could be. And thank you guys. It's huge gratitude. Thanks so much. Um, I also want to say Deeper Learning 2024 is launching. Website is live today. Yes, please. <laughs> Y'all, trust me. I can't tell you the keynote is yet. I can't tell you who the musical guests are yet. But you do not want to miss Deeper Learning 2024. Thank you, What School Could Be. Thank you, Capono. Thank you, Ronnie. And thank you, Mari. I love talking to you, especially when other people can hear it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.